Chapter 158. The War. Captive. Wednesday, the 14th of March, 1979. Welcome home, cub. Remus said nothing, for now. He had nothing to say. He just wanted to get a good look. Fenrir Greyback. Remus had expected him to be taller. He wasn't short by any standards, but when Remus stood up straight, they were eye level. That was good. That gave him a flutter of courage. He may not be taller than Remus, but Groback was certainly bigger in every other way. Hulking broad shoulders, thick squat neck, muscular arms. He had long, thick yellow fingernails, dark wiry hair covering his forearms and sprouting up over the collar of his cloak, meeting a dark beard that was more like fur than hair. His eyes were dangerous, inhuman. The magic radiating off him was not like a wizard's, at least not any Remus had encountered. Like a full moon, it was searing. The scent, while sickeningly familiar, was not inviting. Remus had felt at home with the pack. He had felt like he belonged. But not with this man. He was the enemy, and he always would be. Like what you see? Greyback's smile widened, showing sharp, predatory teeth and long yellow canines. Remus stared impassively back, mouth shut. He realised that Greyback did not like it. Greyback had expected him to speak, to beg, or to rage, or even panic. And Remus knew exactly what to do with bullies who wanted a reaction. He cocked his head, pulled a nonchalant face, and shrugged. It's okay, I suppose. Oi! Could I get my clothes back? Greyback's pupils seemed to dilate, or maybe Remus just imagined it. Either way, he recovered quickly, still smiling stiffly. Where are my manners? Castor! He snapped his claw-like fingers. Castor appeared at Greyback's side in a moment, straight-backed and wrapped up in a fur cloak, carrying a bundle of clothes. Livia was there too, gazing adoringly at her father. The old church they stood in had no ceiling, and in the rosy dawn light, Remus could clearly see Castor's face for the first time. There were three long pink scars down one side, claw marks, pink and soft as burnt skin. Greyback saw him staring. Shame about that, he said, reaching out and stroking Castor's cheek with one filthy fingernail. Castor did not flinch. Hated to ruin something so pleasant to look at. But he's learnt his lesson, haven't you, cub? Castor nodded, staring straight ahead like a soldier. Good boy. Greyback stroked his scarred cheek. Still beautiful, though. Huh, Remus. Remus said nothing and looked away disgusted. And I thought you were a connoisseur of beauty. Greyback tutted with mock disappointment. That's why I sent you my loveliest children. Livia gave a shiver of pleasure at that, tossing her head proudly. Castor held out Remus's clothes, and he took them, dressing carefully. He felt in his jeans pockets for his wand, but it wasn't there. Ah! Greyback growled. Looking for this. He withdrew the long thin stick from his own mud-splattered robes. Remus felt a horrible twist of longing for it. I'm afraid we don't allow these foolish human toys. Greyback smirked. He took Remus's wand in both hands and snapped it clean in two. Remus had to struggle not to cry out. That had been Lyle's wand. In fact, it had been the only thing Lyle had ever given Remus that wasn't completely worthless. He bit the inside of his cheek, hard. Greyback handed the wand fragments to Livia, who twiddled them gleefully between her fingers like battens. Remus raised his chin defiantly. What do you want from me? What I've always wanted, cub. Greyback stepped closer, so that Remus could smell his sour breath, their nose only inches apart. I want to take care of you. He reached out to place a hand on Remus's shoulder, and it took every ounce of Remus's will not to flinch or duck away. 
Greyback's long fingers squeezed him in a fatherly manner, but a bit too close to his throat for comfort. I've come to join you, Remus breathed, struggling to hold his nerve. Greyback tilted his head back and laughed. It was a gruff, wheezing laugh from deep inside his chest. <sighs> That's what my children tell me. Remus Lupin has joined us, they say. He has cast off the human world. But I wonder... He licked his lips and looked Remus up and down. I wonder if Remus Lupin has truly changed his ways. I'm here, aren't I? Remus protested. I spent three moons with... And where were you between the moons? Greyback challenged. He sniffed the air between them. You reek of humankind. With that, he released Remus's shoulder, pushing him backwards hard. Remus hit the stone floor with a thump, and a gasp of surprise and pain as his back jarred. Greyback walked away, his pack dividing to let him through. Castor, Livia, he snarled. Look after our guest. See if we can't wring some of that humanity out of him. Remus climbed to his feet stiffly and went to chase after Greyback, but Livia and Gaius blocked him with their bodies. Over their shoulders, he watched Greyback leave the church through an open archway and disappear into the bright green foliage beyond. Alone and wanderless, Remus backed away from the others warily. He wondered if he could apparate, but he didn't dare, and after all, Surely this was the mission. He had achieved what he set out to. He was in Greyback's pack. Pushing any thought of home or his friends aside, Remus faced his captors. Now was the time to be brave. Livia approached him first, tossing his splintered wand parts away and grabbing his arm, twisting them hard behind his back. Castor came next, same stoic expression on his face. He was unwinding a length of rope, holding it out. Oi! Remus struggled against Livia. Piss off, you're not tying me up. It's not for long, brother, Livia hissed in his ear. It is necessary. Then she licked him. She ran her long tongue up from the nape of his neck, almost to his hairline. He shuddered in disgust, struggling harder, but she only laughed. She was so strong. They bound him tightly, then forced him forwards, Castor leading, tugging on the rope around Remus's arm and body, Livia pushing from behind. He stumbled awkwardly through the church, still unsteady on his feet, having only just transformed. He was shoved towards what once must have been an altar. Behind that was an old arched ambulatory, and beneath those shadows a set of steps leading down to a grave-like cellar. They began to descend, the strong smell of damp earth rising. Where are we? Remus tried asking. We are home, Castor replied, without looking back. Livia gave him a rough jab in the back, and he didn't ask any more questions. They reached the bottom of the stairs, which opened out into a crypt, the vaulted ceiling only just tall enough for Remus to stand straight. There was not much there. A weird, milky light filled the room, but appeared to have no natural source. There were gated chambers either side of the walls, once for tombs, Remus assumed, but now emptied. They had been replaced by blankets, old stained pillows and animal furs. Remus blinked hard, his eyes adjusting to the light, and before he could get his bearings, was thrown forward into one of the cells. Livio growled some incantation, and wrought iron bars slammed close across it, the heavy black chains coiling tight over the lock. Oi! Remus threw himself wildly against the bars. What the fuck? Sit! Livia barked. Remus's legs folded beneath him and he was down. She smiled at him. Rest, brother. Patience. I came here to join you. You can't treat me like... Do not make me silence you! She hissed. He shut his mouth voluntarily. Perhaps it would be better to wait and see for now. Livia licked her lips. 
Try to rest. She stalked away. Castor was left behind, staring at Remus, face unscrutable, body still rigid. Remus stared back. His poor face. Had that been because of Remus? Had he been punished for the last time in the Forbidden Forest? His dark eyes bore into Remus for a long time, unflinching, until Remus scowled at him. What? Is Remus Lupin truly here to join the pack? To submit himself to our father? What do you think? Remus jutted out his chin, though he knew he hardly looked dignified, sitting on the filthy floor with his arms bound against his body. I think... Castor inclined his head slightly, as though nobody had ever asked him about his thoughts before. I think that Remus Lupin does not yet know what he will do. Remus didn't have a response for that. Obviously, he'd like to think that was not true, that his will was iron, unbreakable. But just now, trapped and unarmed and exhausted, he couldn't muster up much pride. Castor didn't seem to mind. He just nodded very slightly and then backed away into the room. Rest, Remus Lupin he said, before turning his back. The crypt was filling up now, the other werewolves were arriving, saturating the room with their scent and their energy. Remus backed into a corner, knees up to his chest, and watched them from the shadows. Their ages only varied slightly. Remus didn't think any of them were older than thirty. In various states of undress, he could see that all of them were thin and scarred, and some tattooed, none of them particularly clean. Still, as they all settled in, apparently to sleep off the events of the full moon, Remus couldn't help but feel some sense of security and warmth. He was still getting used to being surrounded by his own kind, and the urge to settle down and make himself comfortable, as they were all doing, was strong. As if their hearts were all beating as one, they were all part of the same body, and now was the time for sleep. Livia was nowhere to be seen, nor Greyback and Remus took some comfort in this. The dark chamber grew warm, and as the pack settled in quietly, murmuring and whispering among themselves as they bedded down, Remus's eyelids grew heavy and his limbs soft, and eventually the exhaustion caught up with him as he drifted away. "'Where are you, you filthy little beast?' Matron's nasal voice screeched as she stalked up and down the echoey hallways, high heels clicking like a predator." When I get my hands on you, I'm going to wallop you into next week. Remus curled up even tighter in his hiding place, covering his ears with his hands and squeezing his eyes shut. She'd never find him. He was too good at hiding, and very small. He was underneath one of the big boys' beds. He knew he wasn't supposed to be in their dorm. He'd get beaten up if one of them found him. But he knew how to keep quiet. He'd learnt that in the very first few days at St Edmund's, And now he'd been there for some time, he hardly ever got picked on unless he'd really got in someone's way. Remus didn't feel very well. He was starting to hurt all over and his skin was all hot and prickly. He wanted his mummy, but he didn't know where she was anymore. Maybe she'd gone somewhere with Daddy and they'd come and get him soon. Maybe they were hunting down the bad man who hurt him. Remus pinched himself hard. He didn't want to think about the scary man. He couldn't remember much of it, except that he was really frightened. Pinching helped, except now the hurting all over was getting even worse. The bones in his legs stung, and he desperately wanted to stretch them out. But then someone might see him. Finally, it was too much, and another wave of pain forced him to uncurl, letting out a cry. Oh! Aha! Oh no, matron! Suddenly there was a hand around his ankle, and she yanked him hard from out under the bed. "'There you are, you little monster! Come with me! You know you've got to go to your room!' "'No!' he moaned, as she hoisted him up and carried him under one arm. "'Not the room! He hated his room! It was so scary!' "'Let me go!' He beat his fists against her, but she barely reacted, marching down the corridor, down the stairs and towards his cell. 
Let me go! He screamed, crying now, snot and tears running down his face. I want my mummy! I want my mummy! She's not here! Matron snapped. She opened the door and set him down inside, slamming it shut in his face. He heard the bolts go and began to cry harder. It was so dark. He was scared of the dark ever since that bad man, and Mummy always let him have the hallway light on. But Matron wasn't like Mummy. She never did nice things, only horrible things, because he'd been so bad. Was he here because he was bad? Was that why Mummy didn't want him and Daddy went away? He sobbed and screamed, but nobody came. It was too scary and too dark, and it hurt, it hurt, it really hurt. A horrible growling filled his head, and suddenly Rimbus remembered why he didn't feel well, and why he had to be locked in his room. Rimbus awoke with a start. His face was wet with tears, and he was sweating all over. It took him long seconds to remember that he was nineteen, not six, and not locked in his cell at St Edmund's. He hadn't thought about the home for a long time, and he had never tried to rehash those memories. His heart pounded in his ears, and adrenaline coursed through him, and he struggled to get his emotions back under control. He was being watched. It was Jeremy, the young man Gaius had been recruiting back in the manticore's head. He was leaning against the bars, peering at Remus. Bad dream, he asked, his voice rasping, as though he was getting over a bad cold. He was thinner than Remus remembered. Remus straightened up quickly, reaching up to wipe his face with the back of his sleeves, finding that the ropes had mysteriously vanished. Had someone come in and untied him? Had Livia done it somehow? The room behind Jeremy was empty now. It was just the two of them. It's okay, Jeremy said conversationally. I had bad dreams too when I first got here. We all do. They tell us it's all of the old stuff coming to the surface. The memories we don't need. Once they're gone, we can start our new lives with the pack. Were you all locked up like this? Remus asked, his throat sore. He was thirsty, but he didn't want to look weak. No, Jeremy shrugged. Just you. They're worried about you. After what you pulled back in the pub... And there are other stories. They talk about you sometimes. Who does? Livia? Castor? Greyback? Jeremy shrugged again. Yeah, that lot. They're in charge. Livia's first, because she was turned by Greyback. You get better stuff if you're a direct descendant. Remus snorted. He wondered if Jeremy knew that he'd been turned by Greyback too, and whether or not being tied up and thrown in a cell counted as better stuff. Jeremy began to cough, a deep, chesty cackle, which racked his body and doubled him over. He pulled his fur cloak tighter around his skinny frame, and Remus finally felt something beyond rage or fear. He felt sympathy. Do you all live here, in this place? He asked softly, looking around the dank cellar. Between the moons. Jeremy nodded. Better than where I was before, he said. Then, as if bored with the conversation, he simply stepped away. I'm hungry, he said blandly. I'll tell someone you're awake. See you. And Remus was alone again. He climbed to his feet carefully, checking that nothing was broken or sprained or too sore. No, He actually felt better than he usually did after a moon, even with Madame Pomfrey's care. If only he wasn't trapped, if only they hadn't destroyed his wand. He reached into his jeans and found that they'd left him with his pocket watch at least. Rumours held the heavy metal object in his hand, letting it grow warm against his skin. He thought about Sirius, though he knew he ought not to. He didn't know who was listening in to his thoughts, and even if no one was... Sirius was a weakness. Was he worried? He must be, Remus told himself. That's what love was, surely. Had he gone to the castle ruin in Cornwall, where they'd agreed to meet? 
had he waited and waited, wondering where Remus was and what had become of him. Perhaps he'd raised the alarm, told the Potters first, then got hold of Moody or even Dumbledore. Remus didn't think either would be much help. As far as they were concerned, Remus would be in one of the three situations. One, dead. Two, completing his mission to infiltrate the werewolves. Three, turned double agent and actually joined the werewolves. And from Moody's perspective, whichever it was, Remus was best left where he was. He hoped no one had said that to Sirius, though. Already feeling his resolve slipping, Remus forced Sirius to the back of his mind. There was nothing he could do but try his hardest to see the mission through. Stay alive and get back to him. That had to be his focus. He paced the cell a few times. It wasn't big, maybe five steps across, three deep. The animal pelts it had been lined with were deer and bear, and something else Remus didn't recognise. Not wolf, not anything native to Britain. He touched the bars. They felt weirdly warm and seemed to hum against his skin. Magic. Having a sudden brainwave, Remus stepped back and closed his eyes. He was a bit stiff and still foggy from sleep, but the magic was there, in the room, left over from the pack and from Livia's binding spells. He tried to gather some of it into himself. It was very difficult without a wand and with his nerves so shaken. He pulled and tugged at the atmosphere around him, but it was like trying to smoke an unlit cigarette. Nothing came through. He just got out of breath. The magic seemed just beyond his grasp. Admirable efforts, dearest. Remus opened his eyes and jumped, seeing Livia now standing in the middle of the room. She grinned at his discomfort and gestured to Jeremy, who was coming down the steps behind her, holding a large pewter jug and a plate with some food on it. Bread and meat. It smelled like rabbit, and Remus hoped it was. He began to salivate almost at once. Livia snapped her fingers, and the jug and plate left Jeremy's hand and appeared on the floor in Remus's cell with a pop. So, he thought, you could transport things through the bars. That meant he could get out of them, if he tried hard enough. Eat up, my darling, Livia purred. Father wishes us to be strong. Thank you, Remus said. He made eye contact with her and tried to hold it. That had worked with Gaius, and accidentally with Danny. They'd submitted to him, eventually. Livia returned his stare and smiled, looking very pleased. That's my boy. Where's Groback? Show some respect. Her eyes flashed, and Remus felt a stabbing pain in his skull. He gasped, pressing a flat palm to his forehead. He is our father, Livia hissed. All right, he yelped. Where is our, our father? It made him sick to say it. That's none of your concern. I want to speak to him. In time, once you have proved yourself. Well, how am I supposed to prove anything locked up in here? Remus raged, frustrated. Livia just smiled back at him. Remus Lupin will find a way. Goodbye, brother. Do remember to eat something. She turned and stalked out, snapping her fingers at Jeremy as she did so. He scurried to follow her back up the stairs, giving one backwards glance at Remus as he did, mouthing, Sorry. Remus watched their feet disappear as they reached the top of the stairs, and then heard a loud grinding noise as something heavy closed over the hatch. The strange light that had illuminated the room all this time went out, like a switch. And Remus was left alone, locked in the dark. Chapter 159 The War Submission Sunday the 25th of March, 1979 Remus was going mad, that was the only explanation. Time passed slowly, each second eked out over weeks, and then hours whooshed by all at once, like missiles, knocking the breath out of him. They bought him meals, and that was the only way he could measure out his days. No one spoke to him, 
Perhaps they had been warned not to. Perhaps it was part of him proving himself. They looked, though. They stared. The pack returned every night to sleep. Sometimes Livia, Gaius and Castor were there. Other times not. Never grow back. Though sometimes rumours thought he could smell him. But that might have been the madness. After two days in the dark, he didn't trust his senses. After a week, he trusted nothing. He was never quite comfortable, always restless and exhausted, pacing until his feet were bruised. He slept little and often, caught between fitful bursts of unconsciousness and insomnia. He had terrible dreams. Every bad memory squirmed its way up to the surface of his mind. Mostly St Edmund's, but also that of summer after fifth year, when he'd been at his loneliest and hated Sirius. He grew paranoid, convinced it was the others, that they were controlling his mind somehow, forcing him to see things he didn't want to see, things that weren't there. Sometimes he dreamt that Sirius was dead. Then, when that wrung out all the terror in him, he dreamt of each of his friends dying one by one, their ghosts visiting him, weeping or raging. When he woke up, he never felt like they'd gone other times, rumours wondered whether he was dead, and this was some extremely specifically designed hell. By the end of the first week, he had lost all sense of shame. He wept, he howled, he kneed. He laughed maniacally, or else curled up in the corner and whispered to himself. He tried to have conversations in his head, but it didn't work the same as before. Grant's calming voice transformed into Livia, Sirius into Castor, and Rimmers was left with no escape at all. In moments of lucidity, he tried to summon more magic, but it was very hard and he was so weak. Sometimes he thought he could do it. One of the others might perform a spell, always wandless, none of them ever did magic the wizard way, to summon something or to illuminate the room, and Remus felt that old stirring of power, but it never lasted long enough. Finally, Remus's parents appeared to him in his head, but also in the cell. Hope was crying. She was still sick even in her death, her face gaunt and haggard. She wore a white shawl, and there was earth in her hair, even though Remus knew she'd been cremated. Lyle was the worst, though, maybe because Remus had no solid basis for him beyond a few candid photographs. The Lyle his feverish imagination dreamt up was heartlessly cruel, with a plumpy upper-class accent and cold blue eyes. Let that Animal, destroy my one, did you? The spindly ghost whispered in his ear. I should have put you out of your misery all those years ago. While the other ghost shamed him, made him feel small and sorry, Lyle had only ever made Remus angry. He raved like a madman at his father and flung himself at the walls of his cage. Peace, brother! Castor appeared at the bars after Remus had been doing this for some time. This is not the way. Oh, fuck off, Remus snarled, holding his head in his hands as he tried to ground himself in reality. Castor withdrew. Remus continued to suffer. He curled up on the floor and covered his head like a wounded dog. That made him think of Sirius. Stupid thoughts occurred to him, like, where was Sirius staying? At the Potters? At their flat? Remus didn't like the idea of Sirius all alone. Was he eating properly? Was he smoking too much? Had he finally fallen off that stupid bike and broken his neck? Was anyone even looking for Remus? He shut his eyes and tried to pretend he was somewhere else. At his tiny London flat, reading the paper, or in his old bed at Hogwarts with the curtains drawn over. At night in the crypt, Remus could hear the rest of the pack breathing, snoring, rolling over. Some of them cried, maybe when they thought no one else was awake. Most of them coughed, a result of the damp conditions. After a week, Remus caught the cough too, and felt weaker than ever. He'd never been bulky. He'd always been decidedly skinny, even after seven years of Hogwarts food. But now, Remus barely recognised his own body, the bones in his hips became sharp, his drainpipe jeans slipped down his waist, and his ribs stuck out like branches on winter trees, and his skin grew dry and raw, cracking in places. 
The physical weakness only compounded Remus's despair. Who did he think he was, joining some stupid rebel army right after school? Had none of the hundreds of books he's ever read given him any common sense? Of course, he couldn't go up against Greyback. The idea was laughable, so laughable in fact that Greyback wasn't even going to kill him. Remus was not worth the effort. He was simply going to waste away to nothing in this cell, and nobody would ever know. You're not trying, Castor said, returning to view him. Maybe it had only been a few hours since the first time he tried to get through to Remus. Maybe it had been days. It must have been daytime, because no one else was in the crypt. Let me out, Remus babbled, clutching at the bars of his cage. Please. Let yourself out, Castor returned coldly. But I don't have my wand. Castor tutted at him. He held out his empty palm, and a blood-red flame appeared in it. It lent a soft, alluring glow to Castor's features, blurring the jagged edges of his scar and making him beautiful again. We do not need ones, Remus. We do not borrow magic like common humans. I don't have enough, Remus groaned, slumping back. Idiot, Castor said, closing his hand over the flame. You are brimming with it. You still think like a human. Why do you think he put you here? To watch me die. Idiot. Castor repeated, shaking his head disdainfully. Why, then? Remus growled. Castor glanced around covertly to find that they were alone. He came closer. His scent was stronger as he positioned himself right up against the cell bars, and Remus felt an involuntary pull of attraction towards him. Castor lowered his voice. You're being tested, you fool. You're only the fourth child of Greyback to return to him. Do you know what position that gives you? What kind of power? You've seen Livia and Gaius. You know what they're capable of. But why? You attacked Gaius last summer. Greyback is worried about you now. He won't say it, but he is. No one challenges those two. No one. I didn't mean to challenge anyone. He attacked me first and I... You acted like a wolf, Castor said triumphantly, his soft lips curling at the corners. And that is what you must do now. Why are you telling me this? Remus eyed him suspiciously, because it made weird kind of sense now, as if Castor had shaken him awake. Because you're no good to me in this cage, Castor said, dark eyes burning with intensity. A year ago, Remus Lupin spoke to me of change, of a better life. I have not forgotten. I seem to remember you laughing in my face, Remus returned bitterly. The pack is everything. Wasn't that what you said? The pack is everything, Castor said fiercely. That has not changed. Other things have. You are not without allies here. If you want my help so badly, then you get me out, Remus said. Castor raised an eyebrow, giving Remus a long, hard, appraising look. It'll be better for you if you do it yourself. The others must see you succeed. Remus was about to ask another question when the atmosphere changed. Livia was coming. Castor backed away quickly and said nothing more. Remus watched him from a distance, his mind finally beginning to work. He needed magic, he needed power, and he needed a good strong emotion to get it going. Luckily, Remus had always had strong emotions in abundance. That and patience. Buoyed by Castor's intriguing proposition, Remus found it much easier to concentrate and to stay calm. Now that he knew he was not entirely alone, the ghostly apparitions became easier to ignore, and he started to notice things, like how the other werewolves were not as homogeneous as they had first seemed. They were all fairly young. Clearly, Greyback had a preferred type. Not one of them seemed older than twenty-five, and they were all thin and scared. But the more Remus watched them, the more he saw their differences. 
friendships and alliances, grudges and feuds, likes and dislikes. When he paid very close attention, Remus could even tell how long each of them had been werewolves. It was clear from the hierarchy. The younger set fell in two camps, the fanatics who worshipped Livia and Gaius, and those who were less sure, less comfortable with this weird subterranean lifestyle. They tended to side with Castor, sleeping on one side of the crypt, talking amongst themselves. Gaius, in particular, seemed troubled by this group. He stalked the crypt floor every evening, demanding quiet, ordering them to lie further apart. Remus knew from their first meeting in the manticore's head that Gaius had a short fuse, and as soon as Remus latched onto this idea, he knew he had to come up with a way to exploit it. Help eventually came from an unexpected quarter. Jeremy, one of the very youngest members of the pack, and so far the only one who'd ever spoken to Remus other than Castor and Livia, got bored easily. He had a mischievous side, which reminded Remus of James and Sirius. He often cracked jokes to make the others laugh, and was one of the more vocal complainers when it came to the living conditions. Gaius disliked him immensely, of course, and never missed an opportunity to put him back into his place. One evening, as everyone was settling down to sleep, Jeremy was struck by a particularly violent coughing fit. In Remus's opinion, he was definitely hamming it up. It went on a lot longer than probably necessary. Control yourself, brother! Gaius hissed on his feet at once, crossing the crypt to stand over Jeremy, teeth bared. <coughs> Sorry, Jeremy spluttered, scowling sarcastically. I can't help it, it's the damp. Your brothers and sisters seem to manage well enough. Gaius returned, bored. Jeremy snorted. Gaius raised a hand, as if about to cast a spell. Perhaps you need to be reminded how to behave. Jeremy licked his lips nervously and fell quiet. Castor, who had been sitting nearby, stood up. He placed a hand on Gaius's shoulder. I will speak to him, brother. Do not concern yourself. Our father demands obedience, Gaius hissed. Castor's eyes flashed. I am well aware of our father's demands. Gaius clearly wanted to retort, but seeing the fire in Castor's expression, thought better of it and withdrew, sulking away, slapping angrily at three young women huddled together who had been watching the whole thing. Castor crouched and whispered to Jeremy. Do not provoke him. He's a prick. He's not greyback. He can't order us about. Do not provoke him, Castor repeated, a note of warning in his voice. It was not heeded. I was coughing. I couldn't help it. Not as if I was whistling a jaunty tune. Giggling came from the women nearby. Peace, Castor said. Everyone seemed to settle down after that. Order and quiet was restored. Remus sat leaning against the back wall of his cell, arms hugging his knees. In one hand he clutched his pocket watch, which had grown hot and slippery from being held all the time. Suddenly, there was a long, low whistle. Remus's eyes snapped open, his stomach turning over. That maniac. The girls near Jeremy were giggling again as he began to whistle a little tune. Remus thought it sounded like Mary had a little lamb, but he wasn't very good with nursery rhymes. It only lasted a few bars. Gaius was on him in seconds, snarling, hands around Jeremy's throat. The young man's body went stiff as a board, and Remus could instantly smell the charcoal black magic Gaius was using to subdue him. It was like a faint tingling sensation. All of the hairs on his arms stood up. Remus closed his eyes and inhaled, drinking in on the magical energy as though he'd been thirsting for it. The deliciousness was heightened by Gaius's terrible rage, by his flaming desire to hurt. That was it! That was it! Remus was giddy with excitement as the pieces clicked into place. Brother! Livia's voice now. She slinked across the floor towards Gaius, languid as a cat. Leave the pup. He is restless and spirited. That is all. Gaius released Jeremy, who collapsed back, coughing harder than before now. Remus could smell the salt from his tears. Castor knelt beside the young man, a kind hand on his shoulder. Remus began to think quickly. 
He was rubbish at whistling. He could wolf whistle, and did Sirius love the irony of that? But he wouldn't carry a tune. What else would be annoying? He needed Gaius's attention. He needed his rage. He cleared his sore throat. <clears throat> Still don't know what I was waiting for. Remus tried, his voice a bit croaky and reedy from lack of use. There was a flutter of movement, a sense of ears pricking up, as if they were waiting to see what he was up to. It was badly out of tune too, but it was the only song he could remember all the words to. Remus swallowed and raised his voice louder, standing up, approaching the bars. My time was running wild. A million dead-end streets and... A bit more movement now. A few of the younger ones were sitting up, peering over at him. He continued to sing. A few sniggers. Someone whispered, He's finally lost it. So I turned myself to face me. Remus shut his eyes and bellowed, rolling his forehead against the cold bars. Silence! Gaius's sharp voice rang out. I'm much too fast to take that test. Silence! Remus tipped his head back and took in a deep breath. ch 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 changes turn and face the strange ch ch changes Remus Lupin! Gaius was up, striding towards him, one hand raised. Stop this at once! Don't want to be a richer man! Remus continued, feeling Gaius's fierce magical energy filling the space between them, like a tidal wave of hot air rushing over him, drenching him. He squeezed his pocket watch tighter and drew the magic out of that too, sucking it into his bones, his very marrow. Remus opened his eyes and the bars of his cell vanished like smoke. Grinning, he stepped forward, crossing the threshold into the crypt. He was free. Time may change me. He half sang, half laughed at Gaius, who stood before him gobsmacked. Get back, Olivia, Castor, help me. Shut up, Gaius. Remus raised his hand, barely thinking about it, just letting the magic do the work. Gaius was silenced. His mouth opened and closed a few times, eyes wide with terror. Remus felt a good surge of pleasure in this. Yeah, fear me. Good boy, he smirked. Now, in your pop. He stood aside and pushed Gaius forcefully into the cell, before snapping his fingers so that the bars reappeared at once. Gaius found his voice and roared furiously. Let me out! Remus laughed. He was about to turn to address the rest of the pack. They were all murmuring now, various degrees of nervousness and excitement. He felt a hand on his shoulder. Livery appeared on his right, Castor to his left. They were both smiling, pride gleaming in their eyes. My brother, Livia whispered. At last, father will be so proud. End of chapter 159